It's fitting on Pentecost Sunday that we would hear our biblical text from the second chapter of the book of Acts. So listen now to God's word as it comes to us from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 8 and 14 through 21. Listen to God's word. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them, and all were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every people under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one of them heard them speaking in the native tongue of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each one in our own native language? But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your children shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall see dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I will show portents in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of our God will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of grace and glory, we give you thanks and praise that you are a God who desires to reveal yourself to us and among us and through us. That you are a God whose love for us is so strong that you are with us always. And so we pray that you will attune our ears, our minds, our hearts, our senses, so that we might hear your word to us and for us, and that we might notice your spirit at work through us, that we might always live as your people, here and afar. May the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So my son and I were talking about belly buttons the other day. Now, it is a topic that has come up from time to time, though it has been years since he has pointed to his belly and asked me to off to smother it with tickly kisses. He's in first grade. So our conversation was more scientific in nature. Science class has taught him that, there, that bodies contain digestive systems and respiratory systems and circulatory systems. And so he wanted to know why we had belly buttons. Now I'll say it was close to Mother's Day and his birthday had just passed and I surprised even myself to notice that I was a little bit in awe of the belly button as I was answering his question. 
Here I was putting my dishes away, talking to my kid who was jumping on the trampoline in the kitchen, because of course we have a trampoline in the kitchen. And I was finding myself filled with awe over belly buttons. But bear with me. In simple terms, belly buttons are the marks we bear on our bodies that remind us of our literal, physical connection and reliance upon another. Now, although a belly button itself has no other function than to serve as something of a lint trap, they remind us of the truth that we could not exist if not for another body whose body provided ours with shelter and food and oxygen before we could breathe and move and eat on our own. Our own formation is literally anchored in our ability to connect to another. And then, in our miraculous ability to quickly adapt to our world untethered and breathe on our own. It is pretty amazing, isn't it? We greet our disciples in an upper room once more. As we have seen many times since the night that Jesus was betrayed, the night they gathered in an upper room to break bread and share a cup, the disciples have longed to remain connected to Jesus and to one another, but they have struggled to do so. So much has changed since they left their homes and families to assume a new call as Christ's own. And now they're floundering without Jesus' literal, physical feet to sit before. They've been floundering since they scattered that night in the Garden of Gethsemane, since they were struck in terror just weeks before. Now they know that Jesus is the source of their connection. In their recollection, he alone tethered them to God and to one another. He became their home away from home, the one whose presence gave meaning to their lives, so much so that they left family and vocation to travel with him. Jesus was their literal protector from storms. He was the one who provided daily bread and then who could take whatever crumbs they could find of their own and make those into a feast. And all that has changed yet again. In a very short time, the one whose flesh and bones they followed was crucified and died and then rose from the grave, and now, just days before this upper room gathering, ascended into heaven before their very eyes. The disciples have been learning and learning and learning again how to adapt in the world without Jesus' flesh and blood to cling to, that they might with one voice and spirit breathe and move on their own. As a newborn baby adjusts to the world outside of their mother's womb and breathes its first, their first breath, the disciples must adjust to a world in which they cannot just reach out and touch Jesus' hand, even the hand bearing the wounds of the cross. Who are they? if they are physically separate from Jesus? Do they still share the connection that drew them together and gave them an identity and a call? Is their identity as individual disciples and as a community still intact even? How can they adapt to change yet again? It seems so appropriate to me that when the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised to send arrives, 
It shows up as an exchange of air, of wind and flame and speech. The breath of God descends upon Jesus' disciples and indeed the whole world, filling up Christ's people with all they need to navigate the world as followers of Christ. This time, though, they would be Christ's body in the world. Through their hands and feet and flesh and bones and voices, Christ's work would be done. The Holy Spirit would make it so. The breath of God breathed new life into those filled with grief and fear and confusion, sealing their identity in Christ and empowering them to enflesh God's love. The Holy Spirit brought curiosity and hope and possibility to all, to those of every gender and race and age and social location. They all were filled with understanding and awe. They were all called to do Christ's work. Those once separated by language, ideology, those who may even have looked across an aisle and seen an enemy were now called together. They were aware that they were breathing in the same air and that here among them all, within them all, the spirit of the living God would reside, magnifying their unique and specific gifts, but calling them together for a common purpose compelling them to draw together, to change course, to share what they had with one another, whether that be wisdom or clothing or a prayer. God's people were filled with love. Now, as Miss Sarah has already told us, it is no wonder that we call Pentecost the birthday of the church. For it is here that God's people took their first breath as the body of Christ. It is here that the disciples of the living God breathed in God's spirit and learned that through them, God's will, God's love would be made known. So each year we gather and celebrate this birthday we tell the story of that first Pentecost again, and with awe and wonder, we look back and recall the birth of the church. We know and notice that new life is awesome, and new beginnings are full of such possibility. And we gather today with the knowledge that although we weren't there in that upper room to hear Peter speak words in his native language that we would understand in ours, the story, the birthday party, the church's story is our story too. For we are the people today through whom the Holy Spirit is at work. We are those anointed to proclaim the good news of God's love, to enflesh justice and mercy, to embody and implement care for all. We are those who witness to the reality that we are inextricably linked to God and to one another, and to the many that we have never met because we are across race and gender and language and class and social location, we are the body of Christ. Now, I am not gonna stand here and pretend it's easy. In fact, being the body of Christ is oftentimes hard work. There is chaos, there is confusion, there are differences in opinion and different ideas of how we should do the work before us. There is loss and confusion and frustration that things aren't the way they've always been, and that so much that has been familiar about being church feels like it might be slipping away. There is the reality 
that even among those who love Jesus, there are striking differences in belief. And sure, it's evident among those who have a microphone in which they can speak, whether at a commencement ceremony or in a pulpit or on a news show. But we know that those beliefs are manifested between us and our neighbors in our everyday conversations with those who, like us, say they love Jesus too. It's not easy to be church, just like it's not easy to be family. It takes work. It takes commitment. It takes an openness to being formed through the connection we have in Christ and a perseverance to keep making our way together. Not because things always go the way we would have it, but because God is God and God calls us together as one. See, we are the body of Christ. We are God's church. We are vessels of the Holy Spirit summoned and sent to be Christ's hands and feet. We are connected. We bear the imprint of belonging to God and to each other, not as members of an elite and exclusive club, but as instruments of love, ever reaching, ever welcoming, ever sharing God's love. And God is with us still. The Holy Spirit who brooded over the waters of creation, who nudged John to dance in Elizabeth's womb when Mary drew near, who opened the heavens at Jesus' baptism, and who ushered the church into being with a mighty wind, is our life breath and unifying force even today. Siblings, there is a faithful God who dwells within us, who is at work among us and through us, equipping us to serve and minister faithfully, who sends us out and gathers us together as one. God is with us still. Now what's more, we are with us still. As was true on that first Pentecost, by the power of the Spirit, we also bear Christ to one another. When we cannot touch his wounded hands for ourselves, we shelter and protect and feed the bodies and spirits of God's people. And we take cover, and we fill up, and we reach out for a hand of support because God is at work in those who care for us, too. We are the body of Christ, with God's own breath of life flowing through us and making us one. We belong to each other just as surely as we belong to God. So happy birthday, church. We have so much to celebrate today. Will is about to be baptized. Eight teenagers in this front row who are fabulously gifted, as you have already seen, have spent hours together all year learning about God, talking about what it might mean to be church, to share God's love with God's creation, with all of our neighbors and with one another. They have milked cows. I think that's a confirmation first at ELPC, at least in my time here. They have created a worship service of their own. They've played hide and go seek and written statements of faith. They have laughed. They have offered thoughtful answers to complicated questions. They have looked out for each other. They have zoomed into confirmation class on their way to soccer games. They have come to confirmation class after lacrosse games. They have done the work of being together. 
of learning from one another and celebrating the community that is God's church. And so this morning, seven youth will be joining ELPC as full adult members of our congregational family, though let's face it, they've already been really important members of this church for some time now. And Smithfield United Church of Christ is blessed to welcome Pippa Barlow as an adult member through her confirmation that will take place on June 2nd. And we rejoice that Pippa has participated in our confirmation class this year too. It would not have been the same without her. So church, we have a lot to celebrate. As we look at where we've been, and as we look ahead to where we are going, may we rededicate ourselves to the shared work before us, to living into our identity as God's people, as Christ's body, giving thanks for the breath of God who gives us life and purpose and makes us one. May we carry Christ's grace into this world so that all will know that they are loved. Happy birthday, church. Let's celebrate. Let's get to work. And let's love each other as God first loved us. Amen. <laughs>